Hi, uh, welcome back to Monroe Live. Uh, I'm Julian Ates. I'm joined by my colleague Antonio Dineno. And today we're going to be going over the Hummer EV battery pack. Uh, we can see that we have the uh, primary housing for the pack laid out uh, on the floor next to us. To start with a high level overview, this pack itself, as dropped from the vehicle, was about 1,278 kilograms. So that's somewhere on the order of uh, you know, over 2,500 pounds. Uh, so this, as far as the battery packs that we've torn down, is extremely uh, heavy. Um, the entire construction is uh, comprised of stamped steel, which Antonio, typically when we tear down a battery pack, we expect to see some level of aluminum in the enclosure, as well as some inclusion of either castings or extrusions. Right, because of electric vehicles, your primary driver is efficiency. So rolling resistance, your um, aerodynamics, all these things are being considered to uh, improve the mileage that you get at the end of a vehicle. So if you can reduce weight, you reduce your rolling resistance, you reduce your drag. Um, I mean, the Hummer is a bit of a barn on wheels, so you're not, they're not worried about aero, but right. they can still take care of the rolling resistance. Then again, this thing also has massive tires, so they're not maybe concerned about rolling resistance either. Right. Um, but weight, weight can be reduced to help with that a little bit. And they don't seem to be concerned about that much either because this is a small car right. without wheels. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, this, I, the battery pack alone, it, this, it was uh, a chore in and of itself to figure out how to remove it from the vehicle. Typically, we work with battery packs that are a fraction of this size and weight. Uh, so that was a challenge in and of itself. But uh, the pack itself is mounted to the Hummer itself with uh, 28 bolts. As removed, the entire battery pack itself, including fasteners for the lid uh, and all of the modules inside, comes to about 257 fasteners just with the pack itself. Inside, we have, uh, again, kind of a unique configuration here. Uh, what we effectively have is two 400 volt battery packs packaged in parallel with one another. So we see here, we have the upper layer carrier, which is a separate stamped assembly. This is comprised of about 105 discrete stamped components that are a combination of laser, projection, and uh, MIG welded together. Uh, this is to accommodate the upper level, which contains 12 battery modules on its own. And uh, with this removed, we would then see similar lateral stamped uh, cross members in the base tray itself. Uh, which would be effectively inside this entire uh, perimeter here. That then contains an additional 12 modules. This main housing is, uh, uh, I believe, comprised of 139 uh, independent stamp components that are then laser projection uh, MIG welded together and spot welded together as well. So there's quite a high component count here. Uh, I mean, you can see just looking at everything that's comprising this front here, typically in something that would be of a similar geometry, we'd usually expect to see maybe a, uh, a front piece like this where there's a more complex geometry, some curvature might be uh, cast aluminum, then running out to side rails that are made of uh, you know an aluminum extrusion, but here every single bit of this is stamped steel. And Antonio, there would be obviously a cost uh, advantage to that. You have to do a little bit more processing because there's so much welding going on. I believe throughout just the housing itself, there's over 3,500 welds uh, of one form or another. So the processing cost is going to be quite high, but steel compared to aluminum you are going to have a cost advantage there, so. Right, it's um, steel and aluminum are both very cheap materials. They're very abundant. Uh, steel is much cheaper though. Right. And when it comes to saving cost, sure, use steel. But mm -hmm. when it comes to the processing, they might have actually lost out on cost because of right. um, how much extra stuff they've had to do. How many uh, laser welds, how many welds were on this thing in total? Uh, it, between the upper layer carrier and the base tray uh, assemblies, there were over 3,500 welds. So almost two tons of welds. Right. So there's a whole lot of processing going on here, and it's, it's clear to see even just from the upper layer, uh, which we saw something very similar in the uh, F-150 Lightning. It had a separate uh, carrier for its second layer of modules. However, there in the entire F-150 battery pack, we relied a lot on aluminum and there were various uh, aluminum extrusions, especially for the uh, lateral reinforcements. 
and here it's, I don't know if you can pick it up well on the camera, but there's effectively a C-shaped stamping capping off the top here, and then an additional C-shaped stamping underneath it, with then additional uh, corner uh, L-shaped stampings to anchor the mem cross member itself to the base of this upper layer carrier, with some additional separate stamped brackets for the uh, corner mounting. So something like this has a high component count, uh, whereas uh, competitively we would have seen just a, uh, an extrusion. Um, tooling for extrusion is uh, relatively cheap. Uh, it's very uh, inexpensive to change or adapt an extrusion tool depending on your development process. Um, but so this is a unique execution compared to what we've seen, but uh, overall the battery pack itself like we said has 24 modules in total uh, and we'll go into it a little bit later uh, but antonio we effectively have two parallel battery packs inside this right one for drive mode and also for charge mode right so it's a little bit more efficient to charge at high voltage so they use the 800 volt system for charging and for managing your uh the amount of charge you have over time severing it into two packs mm -hmm essentially making them almost in parallel right um saves on the amount of dr uh, current you draw so mm -hmm. extend your range of putting them in parallel make them charge faster by putting them in series right kind of clever uh but then if we look uh toward the front of the battery pack this is the power distribution unit and uh what we have packaged up front is effectively the entire assembly where normally we have contactors, uh, pre-charge relays, things of that nature, and uh, this is a pretty complex system that they've packaged in a very tight space here that contains eight total contactors, uh, each one with their own dedicated uh, liquid cooling uh, equipment, and effectively each set of four contactors controls one level of uh, this uh, battery pack. Um, so we'll go into a little more detail about that, but just in terms of packaging, uh, Antonio, I think, uh, at least from my perspective, they did package this very well, even though it is a massive pack. Right, I mean, for the most part, the numbers most people focus on when they're designing these is watt hours per liter and watt hours per mm -hmm. kilogram. I mean, it's not horrible mm -hmm. on either of those, so. Right. So uh, with that, now that we've sort of grounded in the overall architecture, uh, we want to go down to the module level, which is uh, more where Antonio and I spend, uh, spend our time during these teardowns and analysis. So uh, Antonio, why don't you go ahead and uh, start off with maybe just a brief overview of the module architecture and then also touch on uh, the cells that are being used. All right. So the module contains 24 of the Ultium cells that are 3P8S. Uh, you also have them separated so that each one is owned for a mica covered vent. So it's set of three, set of three, set of three. And if there's a thermal vent, it'll vent off, blowing the mica off and protecting the cells next to it. Uh, so inside the, the cooling plate strategy, we have um, a fair bit of very, very rigid adhesive. So this is actually kind of a sharp adhesive. You probably cut yourself on this after it's cured. Um, the cold plate itself is kind of flexible, but there's these plastic separators in it, which kind of give it its rigidity. And the backside's nothing special. Um, flat surface, uh, tortuous, path sur tortuous path surface. So that's kind of backwards what we normally see. Mm -hmm. You generally want a smooth surface to have contact with your cells for better uh, thermal propagation. Uh, so they've done this backwards and to counter it, they've just applied a large amount of adhesive to allow that thermal transfer to take place. Mm -hmm. They might've done it for more surface area, to, but. Um, right, and so yeah, that's uh, just to build off a couple of things that Antonio had just covered. Um, Specifically with regard to the way that they've configured the cold plate, uh, cold plates are something that we've seen used for uh, pouch cells, prismatics, cylindrical cells. Typically, you want the thinnest possible layer of uh, thermal interface material or TIM to be between the outer surface of the cell itself and your uh, cooling surface, whether that's serpentine such as Tesla or uh, cold plates such as Hummer or Rivian. What they've done 
is uh, toward the bottom side, you can see there's a much more flat profile. Uh, this is a stamped and brazed assembly. So one side of this will typically have a more flat profile and then you can see on the top side actually where the channels are for the coolant uh, supply and return on either end. Um, and uh, the disadvantage to having this uneven surface where your cells are mounting against is from a side view, effectively to ensure that all of the cells are making contact with the cooling surface, you need to even that out. And in order to even it out, you need to add more material in the areas where uh, the surface is effectively lower and a thinner layer where you have the channels stamped and closer to where the cell surface would be. And what that does is it creates an uh, uneven gap and the thicker the layer you have to transfer heat through, the less effective your heat transfer will be. This also has a cost impact in that needing to flatten out the surface using the thermal interface material is going to incur greater use of that material. And it's not and, cheap. And typically this is not an, uh, an uncostly material. This is uh, significant. It's got to, in this instance, provide both structure and a thermal uh, uh, function. Uh, so that's additional cost that's incurred in addition to, and I don't think you touched on this, Antonio, the end uh, injection molded uh, uh, caps or walls of the module itself are effectively uh, planted and sunk into uh, just a large amount of the same kind of adhesive. And you can see from the side view that it's, again, not an insignificant amount. Inside this channel, there is an incredibly thick bead that's been laid that uh, is really, there is no thermal function in this section uh, of, of the cooling plate and what's mating to it. They've effectively just used it as a uh, potting to anchor an injection molded component. So uh, there may have been another way to do that, but uh, using a material like this in that amount for an application such as just anchoring uh, an injection molded component, a component that doesn't need to be cooled, uh, that's uh, fairly atypical and it's definitely going to be a cost driver with this component. All right, um, so Another interesting feature was the back of the current collectors here have these uh, injection molded strips covering a, a, a non-uniform surface. So um, big question we had is why is this even covered? Why not just mold this as a flat piece? Uh, we're not sure, but this surface is flat to allow for the separators to sit. Uh, separators to sit, so you have a uh, a gas separator in the event of a uh, off-gassing event. And maybe we can show that actually on top of the module to give a little bit of context to how this yeah, might be assembled. So, so everything is going long ways as opposed to the right. short ways because these are Ultium cells and they're much longer. Mm -hmm. So as Antonio had mentioned before, this is a, a 3P8S yes. uh, configuration. And so effectively this separator is going to be between each group of those parallel cells. And this is to provide uh, both thermal and electrical isolation. Um, right. And the separator itself, it looks simple at first. <laughs> right. And yeah, actually, Antonio, we've got the one that we've pulled apart here if you want to so, go into a little more detail about how that's constructed. So um, first you have your foam layer. So that comes off. Uh, three pieces of tape hold that on. Underneath that is a polyethylene piece of tape. Uh, and under that is a sheet of metal. And between the sheets of metal are these foam strips of insulating material, another piece of metal, and then another piece of uh, foam strip. Right. Yeah. right, so in all, just in the separator, there are three separate stamped sheets of aluminum, two sheets of a uh, stamped, uh, feels like a uh, type of, what material do you think that might, might be? It might just be a talc filled uh, polyeth polypropylene, but it is supposed to be an insulative material. So it's dusty. It's mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of complexity just inside this Simple. separator itself. Yeah. And then the perimeter to accomplish sealing against the component that Antonio and I were looking at uh, effectively has uh, what appears to be weather stripping, which is simple. It doesn't require a specifically designed component. 
Um, but it is, it, it's, it's just interesting to, to see that being used here. I don't know if we've seen a material like that inside of a battery pack. And it ran along the top surface right. as well. So we had edge sealing here as well as on the other side, it's been removed. And then we had a different type of sealing that ran along the bottom edge. All right. So we also had a second type of separator. So this one was used for measuring temperature. This is underneath your thermal sensor on the top of the module. There is a piece of graphite tape applied to a, uh, looks like a nylon piece of uh, plastic. And all it does, it sits under there, your thermistor goes on there, and you measure your cell temperature on either side. Mm -hmm. Right, and then that is, uh, if we adjust this here, in, in module, uh, this tape would be, uh, right here next to the uh, thermistor where there's a little bit of uh, foam there to provide some compliance and ensure that it's pressed against that thermally conductive surface. Antonio, as far as the cell temperature sensing in modules goes, this again is a very atypical execution from what we've seen, yes? Right, usually you have a couple points that are being measured, one, or, one at your uh, hot point, one at your cold point, or a, the other option is to have a um, on your thermal system, your turnaround point where you have your lowest delta between your hot and your cold. Right. So this looks like your turnaround point where they're measuring, but they're measuring between two cells, so maybe right. they're not getting, maybe they're getting a hot spot and a cold spot. It's mm -hmm. not really going to be uh, a very good signature of the rest of the module. Right. So to Antonio's point, effectively on either side of this injection molded piece, there would be a cell here and a cell here both of which would be contributing to the temperature reading being picked up by that thermistor. Uh, therefore, it's uh, yeah, interesting to think, obviously, whatever testing and validation they did, that seems to be sufficient for their thermal management strategy. However, typically we've seen one thermistor on one cell uh, and there's no combining of, uh, of temperature sources per sensor. True, but wait, there's more. We have another separator that goes between your outside plates and your cells. So this is for isolation, uh, another big piece of double-sided tape, and yet again, more of your separating foam, which is a little bit thicker. Um, so three types of separators. Uh, they didn't use the same one on as this foam here, so that could have been a save if they commonized that. And this piece of steel side is for your compression. So understand why this is strong, but this is also um, many laser welds, many different stampings, I think two stampings, and then they're laser welded together. And another, it's, it's, it's just very robust. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing that uh, we want to point out uh, during teardown is the existence on each one of the modules, there were actually two separate stickers. It's the uh, high pot test passed sticker. So uh, typically a uh, high pot test or high potential test is something that would be done for uh, stator assemblies uh, in a battery module assembly. The process would be slightly different, but effectively the purpose of the test is to apply an incredibly high voltage potential across the module to ensure that all of the uh, separations, all of the insulating materials that are incorporated into the module design is able to prevent any arcing uh, and it's able to effectively keep the module and all of these cells isolated uh, in the event of uh, an overvoltage situation. If there's a current between your left and your right mm -hmm. uh, cooling plates, there's lots of isolation. Your cells are right. discharging into the pack. So that's what right. it's looking for. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So then that's, we, it's, it's assumed that some level of testing like that is done at either the module or the pack level, but we don't typically see many indicators on the components themselves yeah. uh, indicating that. And that could actually be driven uh, by the fact that since these cells are much larger, uh, it's not like an 18650, it's not a 2170, it's not even a smaller pouch type cell that we've seen in other EVs. Because these are such large cells as uh, Antonio, I'll, I'll let you elaborate on in a moment here. If you lose one of these, if there is uh, any damage to uh, the module itself, even a group of three of those together is a pretty significant portion of the module's capacity that could be lost. Right, so like a s normal pr uh, cylindrical cell, like the 1865s are four, four to five amp hours. The 2170s are about similar five, range. Similar, five to seven or so. Mm -hmm. I might be off, I might be switching them. Um, 
the 4680s are 22 amp hours. This guy is 103 amp hours. So there's a lot mm -hmm. more energy just in this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's what GM's big claim was. Uh, the Ultium cell is a new and great thing. All it really is is a bigger gas tank. Mm -hmm. It just holds more. It's bigger. It's not really uh, novel in any way. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing about this is we tore it apart and we have all the nice components on the inside. We see the tabs use their ultrasonic welding to connect the electrodes. So nothing unusual there. We have the anode in our cathode, a cathode here, anode here. Mm -hmm. um, they're big. The interesting thing we saw was the stacking method. So a, there's a couple ways of stacking them. So first one is you just take your separators and your electrodes. So you do electrode, place, separator, other electrode, separator. That's a normal stacking. And the other one is Z stacking where you have a machine feeding from the left and right, electrode, electrode, and then it goes back and forth to the separator. Uh, it's called Z stacking. That's a little bit more efficient. They use regular stacking on this method. Mm -hmm. um, Right, and, uh, and to build off of that, Antonio, because these are relatively thick, uh, we have uh, 19 layers of uh, cathode, uh, we have 19 layers of the anode, and then there are about 40 individual separator pieces that are uh, composing that electrode stack. So for something that has so many individual components that need to be placed, it would seem likely that maybe we'd see something that could cut out a little bit of the assembly time. Right, and the, the separator is very flimsy. It's difficult mm -hmm. to control. Right. We see inside the pack a series of nylon lines, which we've come to expect from electric vehicle batteries. The one thing that was surprising to us upon opening the battery pack was the existence of not just the nylon lines, uh, but the fact that just about every inch that wasn't on a fitting was covered in a reinforced uh, either with uh, steel mesh or I believe some of these uh, had an aramid fiber in them, uh, which again is fairly atypical. The one thing that we theorized initially was uh, if we take a look at the lid, uh, which is just over here, the sealing of the lid to the battery tray itself was a fairly thick and substantial uh, bead that was applied around the perimeter. As assembled, uh, unlike some battery packs we've seen with a liquid applied uh, seal from the lid to the tray, there was actually a slight gap that was left uh, intentionally uh, where this adhesive could be accessed. And one of our initial theories was potentially for uh, easier servicing, there would be a gap left for some sort of tool, whether that's an ultrasonic knife or something to cut through the adhesive around the perimeter to assist in cleaner lid removal that wouldn't incur as much damage as uh, happened when we took ours off. Uh, and part of the thought was the reinforcement around the nylon lines could be to protect against whatever tool may be used to remove the lid so that there weren't any punctures in the lines or any leaks. However, that kind of reinforcement is present on the ni uh, nylon lines that run both on the upper portion of the tray along the sides, but then also below for the uh, bottom layer of the modules as well. So uh, the uh, theory is uh, not necessarily um, as strong given that information. So the actual reason uh, we're still a little bit unclear on. Uh, however, seeing that much reinforcement on the nylon lines inside the pack is uh, fairly atypical, I would say. I'm leaning towards target audience. We have tactical cooling lines. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, typically in your electric vehicle, you'll have a series of contactors, pre-charge resistors, relays, uh, basically everything uh, that you'll need safety related for your high voltage components. What we have here is all of this, uh, effectively for two 400 volt battery packs, uh, packaged into a single assembly that's then tucked at the front of the pack. We have four contactors, uh, which you can see in these uh, larger sub-assemblies here, that are then attached to their own uh, cooling line with a thermal interface material between them. And uh, Antonio, do you want to talk a little bit about how they're leveraging these contactors and their two parallel packs? Uh, I know we touched on it earlier, uh, but the 400 volts versus 800 volts and what they're using it for. Right, so that's a charging versus um, usage. So 800 volts will charge quicker, 
just because you're utilizing the cabling better. Um, the usage is going to be at 400 volts, and that's because the drive units themselves are better able to handle that. Um, I was also talking to some other high-performance electric vehicle people that might be making something faster than a Plaid, and they said uh, that they also had to use water cooling for their, or liquid cooling for their contactors just because of the draw that they were getting. So right. it's probably a charge cycle draw, uh, so they're cooling it during that cycle. Right. Uh, and I think another thing that's uh, important to note is, and this is likely driven by, again, going back to the packaging space, everything in here was incredibly tight, and as a result of that, or potentially as a result of that, we didn't see any aluminum bus bars anywhere inside the pack. We were using copper uh, throughout, uh, from module to module, for your main positive and negative uh, bus bars inside the power distribution unit. Uh, so very likely, because they did not have the packaging space to accommodate for, I think it's about a 56% increase from copper to aluminum and cross section, if you want to have that same current carrying capacity. They likely just didn't have the space to accommodate for that, so there was a little bit of opportunity for cost optimization here, but likely was not uh, obtainable just due to packaging constraints. So the Hummer itself, um, watt hours per kilogram, watt hours per liter, these are the main things that people look at. So it's better than the Tesla Model Y um, on watt hours per kilogram, but this is because Tesla's 2020 Model Y up to 4680 had a low watt hour. That was a 67 watt hour vehicle, kilowatt hour vehicle. Um, the Hummer is a 205 kilowatt hour vehicle. So watt hours per liter, it's an efficiently packed pack itself, packed pack. Uh, so. I mean, the Lucid is way above that. The Model S Plaid is above that. Um, but that's also how they're, like we said with the Lucid, they're mm -hmm. using every inch possible, maybe even inches they don't have. A Hummer is um, it's just efficient, I mean, space-wise. Mm -hmm. So yeah, large pack compared to everything else. So this is what feeds into that value. Uh, but the one that everyone forgets is miles per kilowatt hour. Uh, the Hummer is dead last in that one, and you kind of can see the more efficient your vehicle, uh, the more range you're gonna have. I mean, we also have to separate trucks out from heavy right. duty trucks versus... Because this is effectively in a different weight class from almost every other vehicle we've torn down. Right. But at the same time, the Rivian, it falls below the Lightning, which also speaks to um, efficiency and design. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally, yeah, your uh, cylindrical cells are performing a little bit better here because of the way they can be packaged, the fact that they're uh, able to put more in parallel. Mm -hmm. It helps a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there are also cars that are more aerodynamic. Right. Yeah, and it's, again, this was a 9,000-pound vehicle. Uh, so it's, again, yeah, that mass alone is going to have a fairly substantial impact on your, your mileage despite right. any powertrain efficiencies you can gain. If you're fighting against mass and you don't eliminate the mass, then there's really only so much that you can optimize it to. So um, so I, I think that just about wraps up our uh, overview of the Hummer battery pack today. Uh, I believe we'll have a few more of these coming up. So uh, thank you for watching and stay tuned.